Hi everyone, welcome to Green Apple Books on the Park. My name is Carl Johnson. I am the event coordinator for Green Apple. Where's Armin? Do I have eyes on Armin? There he is. Okay, excellent. Uh, I'm the event coordinator for Green Apple, and tonight I am delighted to welcome you all to the launch of Armin Gavrudian's The Palace of Forty Pillars. Let's give a hand for him. And I'm very excited to be uh, in this part of his book's journey. Armin is joined tonight by Randall Mann. Let's give a hand for Randall as well. Okay, thank you all for showing up and showing out for poetry on a Tuesday, and for Armin in particular. I appreciate you all. Um, thank you also for, for joining us here in person, and hello to our online audience, hello online people. We are broadcasting from San Francisco. We are on unceded Ramachesh Ohlone land, and we hope that you join us in our pledge to turn land acknowledgement into action by donating either your time or monetary means to an indigenous organization each time you hear a land acknowledgement. Um, at the back desk here, we have a QR code that will direct you to the Ramachesh Ohlone Land Trust website. And you can find more details there on how to participate in this project of rematriation. I have very brief business before we get to the heart of the evening. Now is a good time to silence your cell phones. If you have not already, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, why be that guy? Please don't take a call in the middle of a poetry event. Uh, please do check out our full event calendar online at greenapplebooks.com. If you like what we have to offer this evening, you might like what we have coming up in the future. Uh, the restroom is behind me, it is available after the event and not during the event for obvious reasons. If you need to know how to get there, please let me know and I'll gladly help you. We have books by both of our poets available at the front register tonight. You can find them there. Uh, they'll be up at the front and then they're going to sign them afterward. I'm assuming that will be cool. Cool. They'll sign them. Um, if you've been here before, you've certainly heard me say that when you buy books from us, not only do you support us as an independent bookstore, you support the writers who put so much work into making these books, and then you get to have a book. So if you are able, we always appreciate it. Thank you so kindly. Uh, we have other books too, if you already have those ones. But, uh, <laughs> but you also probably have an uncle or a cousin who does not have those who needs them. So very brief breakdown. Tonight we are going to hear from both of our poets, from each of our poets, followed by a brief conversation and perhaps an even briefer Q&A um, after that. But we're going to hear a lot of poetry this evening and uh, we're going to focus on the celebration and uh, socialization portion after that. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the first poet who's joining us. Randall Mann is the author of six collections of poetry, most recently Deal, New and Selected Poems from Copper Canyon Press. He lives here in San Francisco and is a Green Apple favorite. Please welcome Randall Mann. Thanks, Cor. Uh, okay. Can you hear me okay? Um, this, this night is not about me. This is about Armin and this book. So, um, I, uh, Thanks for asking me to help you launch this, Armin. This is an incredibly beautiful and well-made uh, book of poems, uh, inside and out. And so uh, it's a, it's a, it's going to be a real pleasure to hear you read from them. So <clears throat> I'm just going to read a few short poems and then get off of this. Um, Straight razor. He slid the stiff blade up to my ear. Oh, fear, this should have been thirst, a cheapening act. But I lacked, as usual, the crucial disbelief. Sticky cold, a billfold wet in my mouth, wrists bound by his belt. I felt like the boy in a briny night pool, he who found the drowned body, yet still somehow swam with an unknown joy. That boy. So last night I was uh, with Doug at this event for uh, 
the Keith Haring biography and um, with, uh, that Brad Gooch wrote. And he and I were talking after, <clears throat> and uh, we were thinking of Kevin Killian, because it always seems strange that Kevin Killian isn't showing up to things, and we still kind of can't believe that he's not here or in all of our literary spaces. So um, anyway, I was just thinking about Kevin. So I have this little elegy for Kevin. It's called Tagged, <clears throat> and Tagged was, was one of the many art projects that he worked on. Tagged. The flowers never wilt. The gallerist, a brute. Kevin flips his phone into a crystal flute. We order pay-per-view, a short by Kenneth Anger. I doff my undershirt and I a wire hanger. I'll see him by the cash. I'll do as I am told. And when he frames, I freeze. The center cannot fold. <laughs> <laughs> the sheet is haute couture. He wears the latest taste. The choker, little pearls. Like us, he says, of paste. <coughs> so, <clears throat> this poem is, I guess, a little bit in conversation with uh, Shakespeare's Sonnet 124. Translation. So much has gone to shit. <laughs> My hair. The state. The attics lie on Ellis Street, unfathered. Reporters scribble synonyms for hate. The men in blue have billy clubbed the gathered. And then, as grisly as an accident, comes love. What feels like love befalls the best of us, as if the discontent of days were not enough. I make the calls, or so I think. Desire that heretic is stealing, spider-fingered, all the hours, the years. My scorn, acutely politic, I peck him on the cheek, then hit the showers. Soapy, erect, I'll conjure up a time when love was just a fecal, furtive crime. All right, just, uh... Two more. Um, let's see. <clears throat> All right, maybe let's read this one. Only you. As I skipped out this morning, skipping down Castro Street, the queens upon the asphalt were racks of hanging meat. The pendulum was open. The mix had yet to close. I stepped into the ladder to down a bitter dose. We danced to Only You by Teddy Pendergrass. I sniffed a fetid boy. I felt his denim ass. The bears admired their beers. The chat turned flat and racy. The bartender's a clown. We call him John Wayne Gacy. <laughs> he makes me laugh for breakfast. He serves me guilt for lunch. And when it's time for dinner, he gives my face a punch. I feign dismay, then ask if I may have another. He smiles and always says, 
I am not your mother. <laughs> a bear began to sing. The night is falling soon, and love is never love without a tub of ruin. And lounging in the ruin, what becomes of us? Narcissus in the water, strangled, comodus. He sucked a little straw, then shut his fuzzy trap. This place is just a blemish on the oblivion map. I live a block away. Oh yes, I live alone. I won't be coming back. I do not have a phone. I can't provide the moon. I hope you've said your prayers. I have a special room down the cellar stairs. <laughs> and this is uh, this is the last poem. Um, so uh, I was on Grinder and um, <laughs> I came across this profile description, <laughs> and so um, that description is the epigraph, <clears throat> the epigraph of this poem. And the profile said this. If you can remember the Cold War, you're too old for me. <laughs> Cold War. Because you're 22 and in your prime, you silently refuse to date or date. When war was cold, I had a lovely time. I messaged you and sent a shot of grime, then shot some more. It must have been too late. Because you're 22 and in your prime, perhaps I'm shifting like a paradigm. And all the new assumptions formulate as if our war were cold. A lovely time. I'll exercise my stock, internal rhyme. The currency is yours to circulate. I'm 49, my interest rate is prime. <laughs> Suppose that poverty is not a crime. Suppose you more or less accommodate like war. When cold, we'll have a lovely time. Perhaps you'll click on me in wintertime. Proximity is constant. So is fate. Was I 22? Before my prime, the war was cold. I had a lovely time. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our next reader. Armin Davudian's poems and translations from Persian appear in Poetry Magazine, The Hopkins Review, The Yale Review, and elsewhere. Armin grew up in Isfahan, Iran, and is a PhD candidate in English at Stanford University. His collection, The Palace of Forty Pillars, is the reason we are here tonight. Let's give one more hand for Armin Duran. Um, as I was sitting there, I thought I should have uh, picked an easier act to follow. <laughs> um, thank you, Randall. It's really special to read with you and to read here. Thank you, Carr, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting to thank somebody, but... Um, I'm going to start by reading a translation of a poem by the contemporary Iranian poet Fateme Shams. No language. 
I've brought a mirror to see which of us is more dead. Let's speak in words that are past their expiration date, in tongues that are each more foreign, more eloquent than the other. I've brought a mirror to breathe on and check if we're alive. Let's speak in the seasick accents that we know about forgotten names in tongues that we don't know. I brought a mirror to see in what tongue, at what time each of us drowned. We are the shadows on the ocean floor, turning a mirror on our own tonguelessness. Over the waters we crossed, and to the waters we shall return. Mirror. Whose eyes are those that glisten, glisten, behind my darker eyes, cries? Whose silent lips that part, heart, like fish in that silvered lake, ache? Who writes across your page, age? Who stirs? behind your gloss, loss. The poet James Merrill wrote a poem called The Black Swan, which ends with this line, I love the black swan. It's <laughs> <laughs> not supposed to be fun. Um, <laughs> this is the yellow swan. At noon, the petaled swans, afloat midstream, or parked at the water's rim, find the boy first in line, or there before there is a line. And always, the nice boatman lets him mount his favorite ride, whose name defies all rust and wear. He whispers, I love the yellow swan. A secret he knows better than to share, save in the hollow, ear-like curve of that arched neck whose mirror image breaks and rings of water as he climbs between the wings and petals from the pier, a trail of molted plumage shuddering in his wake. The river foams, churned by the paddle wheel and changed to ocean, its surface cut by the question mark of the swan, no, dragon, gliding on the hissing, blood-stained waters as he turns fire on darkness, almost wins his mission, while his parents chat in the sun, unaware of all that burns down on the other bank. But like most love, the swan ride is cut off the stroke of one o'clock returns the beast to boat, the boat, the boatman. He hates the boatman. He hates his parents, whom he won't forgive. He hates the girl who's next. Poor boy, he hates the yellow swan. <laughs> This poem is titled Surj, which means coffee in Armenian. And that style of coffee is made by boiling the beans in water, I'm sorry, the grounds in, the, in water, and consumed uh, with the grounds unfiltered. Surj, planted, ripened, hand-picked, dried, seeded, skinned, polished, and sorted, lesser crops disqualified, the balance graded and imported, tasted or rather analyzed by slurping, then expectorated, roasted until paralyzed, ground up, potted, irrigated, simmered, poured, sipped and inverted, sedimented and reverted, red and wildly fabricated, happy or sad, single or mated, and if illegible, 
no matter. The future is always black and bitter. Coming out of the shower. I shut my eyes under the scalding stream, scrubbing off last night's dream. When suddenly I hear your voice again, as though it caught in the clogged drain and was sent bubbling back up from the other world where you are not my mother. This time, it's really you. I'm really here. I blink. We do not disappear. Dad left, you say, to shower at the shop. So I don't need to stop just yet. And yet I do, unable to resume old customs, unlike you. In a one bath, four person household, we, Learn what we mustn't see. Growing in time, so coolly intimate with one another's silhouette behind the opaque frosted shower screen that once more stands between us two. While at the mirror you apply foundation and concealer, I wash out my hair with rose water shampoo, which means I'll smell like you all day. Mama, I shout, I'm coming out. And as you look away, I knot around me tight your lavender robe de chambre, cinching my waist, and clamber out of the tub, taking care not to step outside the cotton mat and drip on the cracked floor you've polished with such zeal. We are mirrored in each tile. Yet, you'd forgive the spillage, or forget. What else will you love me, despite? Mm. Checking on my timer. <laughs> um, this book ends with the title poem, The Palace of Forty Pillars, which is named after um, uh, a garden in uh, Esfahan, Iran, and it's uh, 20 sonnets. I'm just going to read six or seven of them and then end with that. And it has an epigraph which in Persian reads Esfahan Nesvejahan, which means Esfahan is half the world. The Palace of Forty Pillars. Twenty pillars drip into the pool, their likenesses, where the likeness of a boy wavers among the clouds, eyeing the boy who is waiting for another. All is dual. Two rows of roses frame the pond. In twos, the swans glide, each on another's breast then fuse in a headless embrace. All is dissolved. The boy outside the water is no more a boy inside the water. His no more the face defaced by its own lines. On shattered waves overlapping like a rose, the tattered pillars strewn like petals. All is halved, severed, like home and school, like love and being loved, the boy no more than a way of seeing. Two, I can see my mother, apron over her nightgown, setting the table for breakfast, a stack of lavash steaming at the center, honey and milk skin, feta with fruit, chickpea and chicken mash dusted with cinnamon. I can see my father 
already in his coveralls and cap, filling the cup to the brim with hot tap water, and emptying it into another cup, and emptying that cup into another, until all three were warmed for tea. I can hear the kettle whistling and pull the covers tight around my head against the coming light. For any moment now, they will open the door and lift the covers and find that I'm not there. Three. My mother sliced the cucumbers on a plate and sprinkled them with salt and lemon juice. A dragon, inked in red, inked in blue, fat as a goose, shown through their pale, translucent flesh. We ate the puckering slices, my brother and I, then dared each other to drain the juice. I wasn't scared. The jellied seeds quivered like dragon spawn. Glazed with acid yellow, their mother glared, and I glared back, startled by my own eyes on the plate. And then it was as though when I tipped up the dish and sucked the brew, the thick spawn burned my throat all the way through, and hatching there made my whole body shudder. I grabbed the knife and pointed at my father. Four. We were assigned, son, straight to the lion's muzzle, the sad-dashed front. Third day, a bang and a mizzle of garlic. I grabbed my gas mask, wished I were home. La 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 azim. I heard him shrieking like a wounded rat. There is no God except Allah the Great. Except there was no God. Allah the Great swelled in him like the prayer call that fills the muezzin's lungs and mixes with his breath until it clots into a bullet, flies, and falls. Five. I lie in my room reading while their tense, angry voices lower to a murmur seep through the door. In the book, a warrior ends another's life and strips him of his armor, an heirloom armlet glinting underneath. It's just a book, but every time I read, it ends with the same fight. He kills his son, then covers him in gold embroidered cloth. I'm young enough to cry, but old enough to shut my eyes as soon as the door swings open and my father tiptoes in to say good night. He pulls the Book of Kings out of my hands, takes my glasses off to kiss my head, and tucks me into bed. I'll always be in love with Father Tikran. I'll wear a long black robe and never marry. I'll stroke my bushy beard and lecture on the holy translators of the 5th century who invented the Armenian alphabet to record the Bible. To translate means to carry from one place to another, like a jet. We are their inheritors in this Muslim country. We brought the printing press to Esfahan. We introduced oil lamps in Austria. We put the first rover on the moon. And when the Turks marched us to Syria, we sent a student my age to Berlin to put a hole in the Grand Vizier's brain. Seven. In my all boys school, they're all dumber than me. <laughs> I sit in the back and read André Gide ins inside the elements of chemistry. 
I draw a naked girl with pointy breasts for my classmates who fold her into a plane and fly it across the room. For the midterm, I make a cheat sheet in Armenian, which our Persian teachers cannot read. When the others leave, I meet with a friend to study. Behind the stacks, he unbuttons his uniform and then lies down, leaning over his body like Alibaba over the thieves' treasure. I copy out the answers on his chest with what I know even then is too much pleasure. This is the eighth and last one I'll read. Thanks for being here. Reading a parallel text tragedy, Persian and English on opposite sides, like lovers whom an ancient grudge divides. I think of gentle Mr. Javadi, copying the cloudy verses out in white as I followed with blue meanings where he led, and we alternated, trying to keep straight till the blackboard was striped. Like the bedspread, I sweated my pent-up love out on each night, then lay there with my hands unwashed and read the story of Majnoon's forbidden love which sent him roaming deserts in search of the sweet beloved he would never reach. When I closed the book, two tongues touch. Thank you. Can we give one more hand for Armin? Congratulations, Armin. I'm, really, I'm very happy for you and happy that we could all be here to celebrate you. Um, we're not quite done yet. I'm going to invite Armin and Randall up now okay. for a little little bit of conversation. <laughs> Things feels really aggressive, like I need consent or something. Um, it's good for the spine. Just so. anyway, uh, we won't keep you long here, I promise. I, so, <laughs> just, uh, I didn't plan at all for this. Um, so I'll, I'll just ask you a question, and then maybe we can open it up or something. So, yeah. um, <laughs> wow, I was really on one for this. Uh, okay, so... get. Given your title, I love this, it's like a comma. Given your title, The Palace of Forty Pillars, and the Adorno quote as an epigraph, The House is Past. Seriously though, I'm curious about your, your about architecture as kind of like your guiding metaphor. So in the subjects of the poems and the ways in which you build them, since your, your poems are obviously very made things, so can you talk about this sort of idea of architecture in your writing? Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> like Randy's own work is very architectural, so you could as easily answer this, but um, um, that Adorno quote is from Minima Moralia, where he is living in Los Angeles out of exile and um, just going from, just observing all of the differences between, I guess, America and um, Europe, where he lived, um, and says the house is past. Um, and I like two things about it. One of them is we often think of a home or a house as a space, as a um, place in space. But I feel like once you've lived in more than one place, then it also becomes a place in time. You when you can't go back. Um, and I remember. I mean, when we first got in here, one of the things that like just sort of stands out to you is um, like I remember just we, we you know got to LAX and <laughs> kept driving and never got to the city <laughs> so, like, and, uh, and we just deposited and went to you know this, some house in the suburbs of LA um, 
And I was just thinking of the differences between that and how houses are in Iran, which is, you know, sort of no, traditionally no outer yard. There's a courtyard in the middle. It's a kind of an enclosed space. Um, and I, I sort of, that's, I wanted to do that with this book, have a kind of, um, like the book begins and ends with a sonnet sequence. Um, the sequences of sonnet, uh, sonnets at the end is named after this palace that I mentioned, which has 20 pillars and are sort of reflected in water. So it's called the Palace of 40 Pillars. So I kind of wanted, um, I wanted to find a form in English poetry that somehow can replicate that. So I settled on 20 sonnets that are somehow divided in the middle around the Volta. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I guess just one more since that was so quick. Um, okay. So as I read the book, I think about some of the influences that seem to be like uh -huh. Trazi and Lowell and Merrill and Frost and others. Yeah. Um, but they seem to me not kind of like just embedded in the poems, but really a starting point sometimes, um, uh -huh. like a catalyst. Can you talk about how you've been enabled by those you've read and you know, how in some ways it seems like you've foregrounded some of these influences and not just have them be some sort of open secret in the poem? Yeah. I mean, I feel like in some ways uh, it's easier to foreground the superficial influences and the ones that are somehow deeper. Um, one tends to be more shy about naming, but um, I mean, I was writing this book while also doing a PhD in English. I think there is always this sort of sort of I th silly tendency to. draw a kind of distinction between I feel like in certain strands of contemporary poetry or contemporary American poetry there's a tendency to draw a distinction between like life and books mm. um, um, <laughs> that sounds silly but mm. uh, I these were part of my life. I, 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 I just wanted them in there. There, there are poems where, you know, I'm attending a, like an endowed lecture at Stanford. Somebody gave on otters in uh, British poetry. And I, I guess what I'm trying to say is like that, that, that felt as much part of my life as, I don't know, my dad's mechanic shop in LA. Mm -hmm. And um, I sort of didn't want to have that kind of easy um, distinction that we get to draw sometimes that um, the cooking and the car and the oil and all of that is real but somehow the books aren't um, when they're such a large part of their upbringing. Um, maybe a more honest answer is also that I think when we got here when I was still learning, studying in, studying English, uh, in, uh, uh, in many ways coming to English was synonymous with coming to poetry. Um, and I wanted to sort of narrate part of the journey too. I mean, I, I, the, like, I remember just when we were, wa we were in Austria and waiting um, for our uh, papers, immigration papers to go through and some I just randomly, I never found the fiction section of the public library. We have this English uh, section. And um, the first books I checked out by, by, were by T.S. Eliot and um, Hart Crane. And there was something, there was something weirdly freeing about being able to um, assign the difficulty of those texts to my own difficulty with English, mm -hmm. rather than simply thinking that poetry is difficult or um, so for, for me it's sort of I mean at least in this book it's just sort of part of the journey of growing up and coming to English poetry um, yeah thanks Sorry. thank you yeah thank you. I was thinking actually of you know the, <laughs> I have this one poem in the book that takes up a form that Auden used you write September 1930 something. Mm. And um, 
you have that one poem that's based on what is it? Walking. Yeah. The, What's the poem? Uh, it's uh, what is, what's as it? I walked out one evening, walking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I feel like it's 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 nice to be able to hear those echoes, but even when you don't hear them, the poems make sense. So. Right. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Okay. Any, yeah. So, does anyone anyone have any questions for Armin? I got one. Um, um, I'm not sure I really know how to ask the question, but I was just wondering if you had a relationship to or like a theory about. Um, it's a. I would term it as like flow, but I'm just thinking about um, the yellow swan, which is a poem I've read before, and the mirror, and just the way. Maybe, maybe it's more about speed, how in some of the poems it seems like the internal rhyme in the meter is like more propulsive and speeding things up versus other times it seems like maybe it's slowing things down. And yeah, just wondering if you have like a theory and how you use those. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, I think, I mean, like, I feel like for me it's a question of uh, playing the prosody and the grammar or the prosody and the syntax against each other. So, for example, in a poem like Mirror, the rhymes interrupt the syntax. Um, and I feel like that slows it down. With the swan poem, it's kind of um, Merrill has the black swan, which every line is either a sentence or a complete phrase or a complete clause. It ends almost always with a punctuation mark. Um, and there's the sense that the uh, the swan becomes the cipher for que queerness. He's writing it when he's in the closet. Everything is like extremely enclosed. Um, uh, and I was sort of, you know, I, I just wanted to do the like, what would it be like? To, what would it be like to turn to sort of? adapt that syntax and that prosody to coming out and I wanted the um, I guess every stanza to spill into the next one and um, I think uh, using kind of a, uh, <laughs> using the, the meter and uh, to work against the syntax a little bit this all sounds very Sort of weirdly highfalutin, but it, it's just sort of like very literal, literally like um, interrupting, interrupting a unit of prosody, like a line, with um, just putting like the punctuation in the middle or putting the end of the sentence in the middle, um, so that I feel like you don't really get, uh, you never get the full rest of ending a sentence and ending a line until you get to the very end. Um, but I can think of these strategies being used for like exactly the opposite end in other poems. So I feel like it's very case dependent. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Congrats on it. Thank you. Um, how do you how do you kind of think about how humor works in your work? Because you you're very like you have a dry wit, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's in the work. Um, and I'm wondering if you have like influences or if you're thinking if that's something mm. you were like conscious of or yeah. it's just kind of like some of us have a dispositional talent for, for wit and, I, and I'm wondering if there's some influence or, or how you think that plays off of there's a little bit of an irreverence to it it seems like at times yeah no I mean I think I just tend to be dehydrated <laughs> uh, no I mean I, I think like it's just I feel like there are sort of two opposite, sort of there's two angles to get at poetry, one of which is it's sort of, you try to, that it imitates how one is in real life or how what one feels or how one thinks. And the other angle is it's sort of like a release valve or sort of a cathartic. So all of the um, taboo or unorthodox or the unacceptable, uh, Feelings and emotions, like having a crush on your priest, going on, or um, 
uh, I don't know, feeling contemptuous of one, one's own parents, even when that contempt is unjustified. Or, um, and I feel like humor sort of, at least I like to think, let, lets me get some of those uh, less unsavory <laughs> or more unsavory feelings in. Um, And I also think because I tend to write a lot in, um, I mean, I feel like, like Randall, who is also very funny, or all, who is very funny, I shouldn't say also. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think the ru 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 humor also acts like, like an apology for, and I guess by apology I mean the older meaning, like a justification for defense of the metrical or prosodic um, investment. Um, uh, so, uh, like, I want the reader to be drawn in um, and not be put off by um, um, right rhyme and stanza and <laughs> whatnot. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Anything else? Oh, small question um, yeah, for right. the fourth pillar: Are the quotations? Meant for something? I have to remember which one it is. We ordered this so many times. <laughs> oh yeah, this is, um, I guess, meant to be spoken by um, the father of the... So it's, ah, okay. in, yeah, my dad fought in the Iran-Iraq war. Um, and has all these uh, crazy stories, some of which have very... Um, which, uh, just like incredibly poetic details, like a mustard gas smells like garlic. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so that's what those do. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, <laughs> Randall. <laughs> this was so great. all of you. This is such a fabulous evening celebrating fabulous work and I'm so happy to be a part of it. Um, would you like to do kind of like a roaming signing or would you like to stay in one place and have people come to you? Oh, we'll sort of hang out and have some wine. And somebody out. needs yeah. signing. Yeah. Cool. Okay, great. I, we didn't, I didn't ask earlier so I'm yeah. asking in front of everyone. Um, <laughs> but great. So you heard it here first. Fantastic. We're going to rove and have some wine. We have books available at the front register. You can find them there. And we'll be around here. If you need anything else, do let me know. And if not, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you.